I'm Thelma Golden and thrilled to be here with Zora Simpson Casebeer, a actor and a thinker and a writer, and Lorna Simpson, artist. Thrilled to be here with both of you and to have a conversation thinking about um, this incredible exhibition, Lorna. So first, I just want to say congratulations. This Thank is you. so amazing to revisit um, this formative, foundational work that was so important to me and who I am as a curator. But thrilled to be here to think about this work anew with you, Zora. So Zora. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here, too. This is such a new thing for me and my mother to get to have this kind of conversation together. So. It's At least in public. And, yeah, that's true. In public. Yeah, in public. So I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, you both, for doing this. Um, yeah, I wanted, I wanted, I guess, to start by asking you a little bit about time. Because, um, of course, this is a show of earlier works from 1985 to 1992. And so when one walks into the space, there's a negotiation of the context in which you made them, but also how they might operate and live in the world today um, as being... The, there being through lines there and also changes and differences. And um, I think also because over the past two years through the pandemic, for many of us, if not all of us, there's been such a reorientation and kind of seismic shift in the way that we relate to time, but also that that might have been something that you were experiencing and negotiating in the period at which you made these works in New York in the 80s during the AIDS epidemic. Um, so time is something that keeps on. I keep on thinking about. I mean, I think... Um for many of those works, yes, time, but particularly if we think of pandemics now, but for me, the AIDS epidemic was I mean, like this moment of devastation of populations and people and going to funerals and friends dying. Um, and then to kind of have the experience we had in LA um, in, and during the pan pandemic, like in doing the show, which I thought in our first conversations with the gallery, I was like, oh yeah, like in two or three years, they're like, no, the fall of 22, I was a little bit like, shocked because um, how, how quickly it got put together. Um, but it was really interesting to kind of look back at this work, some of the issues from this period of time and how germane the same things we are still fighting for, the same things that we are still now are at odds and trying to main, even just maintain having ground. Um, so my question and the thing of, like having this kind of conversation, but um, with my daughter being here, is that you know so much of what's happened over the past two or three years, and being a young person and coming into a world as an adult in this kind of climate, and then looking back at this work in terms of subject matter, was a kind of interesting thing. Just to even get your sense of you know how you might see some of this work in talking about things or issues that are present today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. What's also exciting for me is so much of this work I have never seen in, um, in, in a physical form before, in person before. Uh, so being able to do that is super exciting, but also I think, yeah, kind of maybe, of course so much has changed since you made this work, but also it is kind of a devastating engagement to see ways in which there are questions that we're still asking or still dealing with or being confronted with. Um, and so like, when I say that, I'm talking about um, You're Fine, the piece. I think it's on the third floor. Um, you're Fine, You're Hired. Or also, which I saw for the first time today in person, I think it's Refuse, uh, prefer, refuse, prefer, Refuse, refuse Decide. Yeah. And so, I mean, immediately that, both of those pieces kind of make me think about like reproductive rights and autonomy. Um, and a long history, right? That there's like decades, if not centuries of engagement um, in and around that by black intellectuals in this country. Um, and, you know, whether you're thinking about slavery and reproductive autonomy, or you're thinking about um, uh, the origins of modern gynecology, or you're thinking about um, right now, the obvious reverse, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Um, yeah, I think that that's kind of a hard thing to be confronted with in walking into the space. Um, yeah, that's a difficult course, I mean, experience. for me, walking through the space is kind of this ground is constantly um, at, the, at the precipice of being eroded so that it requires us as a society to constantly um, defend and fight. 
I mean, and that's over the course of this time, that's kind of what this work has shown me. Um, that there is no point of, oh, we got this, or like, okay, things are fine. Or, oh, we understand this, or oh, we got the language for it, because also language changes and needs to grow and change and evolve. Um, so all of these things are very active, I think, um, for generations, and kind of this is just part of the course of life of living in America. If I might say, just listening to Zora talk about yeah. seeing some of these works for the first yeah. time in person mm. makes me want to mark um, mm. how significant right, these bodies of work are and have been and how this exhibition allows for uh, a new generation yeah. to encounter them right, as physical objects. You know, For me, um, as a young curator, this work was incredibly important because of the way in which you talk about some of the subject matter that Lorna was engaging with them. Mm -hmm. But also, I think we have to talk about the sort of formal innovation, the absolute way in which you shifted a whole conversation about conceptual photography yeah. with starting here and these bodies of work and then moving to the color work. So I, I am valuing you know, what it means, Zora, to have you having this experience of seeing these works and understanding how significant they are to so many other ways in which we think about art making um, and basically future making, right? right? And that's what, it for me, time, and you know, we're sitting here in front and, of. And I have to say, I mean, what made this work possible or kind of for me to get even a sense of what I was doing was um, Beryl Wright from the MCA Chicago, who was a black curator at that time, who initiated a solo survey exhibition of this kind of body of work. And the conversations I had with Beryl, who is now deceased, um, but and also um, Saidia Hartman really kind of galvanized for me an idea of how I might express my work and think about it and think about trajectories and think about um, different ways in which I was working, which I think was fundamental in kind of also the work that comes after this period mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also in terms of form, what's really cool and exciting is I feel like, well, first of all, you're working with language in such an amazing way mm -hmm. in this show. Um, and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about language, because also as someone who loves poetry and you know, you very much nurtured that in me growing up, um, it's it's so it's really amazing to see you play and work with language and also in relationship and juxtaposition to the image um, and kind of memory and fragmentation and coded narratives or fragmented narratives, but also, I mean, we can see like that you use all these multi-paneled or severed images. Yeah. Um, so if you could speak also a little bit about language. I mean, I think, um, you know, my influences, I, there are so many, but I would say, you know, of course, Toni Morrison and James Baldwin and um, Marlon Riggs mm -hmm. and Audre Lorde and um, Hell Mouths. I mean, like, even people of my own generation um, and Robin Cost Lewis, um, Simone White. I mean, I think there are poets and writers that I've always kind of looked to, but also immersed in um, during during this period of time. So I never really considered myself a writer because I was like, no, that's some hard shit. Like to be, you know, to be a full fledged and having um, friends also contemporaries who are amazing writers. But I was very much appreciative of language and the kind of and you mentioned to me the other day the kind of slipperiness. Something I said years ago about how language has this slippage and it's our ability to kind kind of grasp or release it mm -hmm. um, in the way that we think about how we express our experiences and the language that we choose or make use of um, to express those things. You also, you did in 2020, two years ago, you published. Oh my God, you really like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we didn't pre-discuss any of this, but I'm like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you say that you've never thought of yourself or spoken about, I love you too, <laughs> spoken about yourself as a writer. Yeah. You did have your first published poem in the New York Magazine a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, we've been whispering in each other's ears for centuries. Yeah. Has that shifted the way that you think about yourself? Oh, your I mean, I to... think um, the pandemic allowed me um, to just write. And that was a really incredible experience um, in a way that I had never, not never, I shouldn't say that, before you were born. I had immersed myself in terms of writing. And so, I mean, now that things have kind of come back and there have been other shows and other things to work, and I do find myself like I have to make time 
to write more um, because it is such an, a beautiful, um, immersive experience for me mm -hmm. intellectually that is much different in a way of working kind of with the visual art. But what was the way that I worked these many years ago, that it was kind of a foothold in these two worlds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's my commitment to myself is to write more. Yeah, And it's interesting because your current work does not include text in the same way right. you had, and now that's coming out in this other way yeah. in your writing. Yeah. I'm curious also if you could speak a little bit about silence, because in this, you've spoken about the slipperiness of language, but also the power of moments of silence, and particularly in literature that shaped you and that you love, Baldwin or Toni Morrison. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm curious about that in relationship to these works, um, also because you've spoken with Thelma before about the uh, kind of your use of negative space and a formal simplicity. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering if there's a relationship I mean, there. I think for me intellectually, whether it's working within a kind of visual aspect or within the text, it's the thing that how to convey an experience in a way that is very close to the experience itself, which is sometimes you do not have words mm -hmm. or you do not have the exact words or the words kind of confuse the way that you want to convey something. Um, or kind of the patriarchy in which we live, <laughs> the words are not sufficient, so therefore new ways of speaking have to be mined and um, uh, heated. Um, and so it, it's kind of that edge of things that I find really interesting because it kind of compels you to think differently or to allow that kind of a subconscious way of like what, was, what would be the right thing that doesn't sound right in terms of the wording that one chooses or, the, or um, misremembering things or things that are said repeatedly that are disturbing and why are they such. Those are the kind of relationships of words to our experience that I find interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I guess, also about Water Bearer um, yeah. because it feels like they're in a very personal way. And you know, of course, my experience is going to be negotiated by a lot of personal or sentimental feelings about this. but. Um, Water Bear is, for me, a piece that's like, I feel like I've known forever, has always been in the forefront of my imagination about your work, and um, also very much feels like a myth-making piece, or in my engagement with it, the openness of language and the image, too. There's this way of, um, if so much of it feels like it's about memory or about uh, forgetting, and also about like refiguring and remembering something, putting pieces yeah. back together. Um, Wait, do you remember? Because we took a trip like before Obama left his presidency. We were like, we got to get to Cuba <laughs> before all of this closes down. Because um, I had never been, but my father and um, his family are from Cuba and Jamaica. And there was a moment when we were by this river, when we were in um, Havana. Do you remember that? But anyway, it's kind of that piece is based on a family story. Um, about being near a river. So yeah. it was really at, at a certain point, um, and I guess it was in 2016 we mm -hmm. went to mm -hmm. Cuba, yeah. um, to kind of try to piece together, because um, I had family that left Cuba right before Castro took over. So imagining the stories, imagining things that have been said to me and this kind of whole cultural life um, that I experienced as being first generation American on that side of the family, um, to kind of be placed in that environment. And so for me, um, the connection to Cuba and, the con and of course, you know, it's the feud, it's the music, it's, it's and the language, it's a, it's a lot of things. Um, but in some ways, living in America and kind of negotiating that identity, it was quite an yeah. opportunity to kind of make a physical connection to a place that I had never been, but, but felt was very much a part of me. Mm -hmm. right. And the text itself, Lorna, comes yeah. from the memory of the family story or was it a sort of sense that you, you knew this story? No, it, it comes from a, a story that someone in my family told me, but it, what was, um, and I guess in many, like my other side of my family is American, from kind of American South, um, New Orleans and Mississippi. So, you know, many of the experiences, I think, of people of color, you know, kind of in uh, this northern hemisphere, have a lot to do with memory, a lot to do with discounting of memory, mm -hmm. a lot to do with, um, you know, just pretend that didn't exist uh, as a kind of reaction 
to experiences and to uh, one's living and, and what happens. Um, so I found those echoes kind of in both sides of my family in a way. And I think um, in growing up, that was the echo, that was kind of um, apparent to me as a, a young person, as a child, that that was kind of a thread. So in becoming an adult and making art, that memory became this thing of the way that I saw um, how memory was negotiated um, was of interest to me. But also, right, the way that um, certain things are coded or that there's a level of, and maybe this is also a generational thing, like your grandmother, um, the way that information is withheld or coded or kept secret or private. Um, I guess that also, like, I also wanted to ask you about the word withholding, I think, um, because I know that that's a word that has been used a lot in conversations in and around your work. And... Well, because I think the withholding is... Basically, I don't want to dictate the entire experience of this work. I would like to suggest through the way one experiences uh, language and uh, this kind of inescapable problematic that um, the way things are said or the way your experience is kind of uh, delivered back to you mm -hmm. seems somewhat inefficient or misses the mark. Mm -hmm. And so my withholding is just to really peek to like the slippery thing of language and that there are double meanings or that, mm -hmm. you know, or they don't apply or that they're in opposition to one another as a way to think maybe more broadly of, the, of how we speak, uh, mm -hmm. how we address what we call people, how we address people or situations and with what kind of clarity or honesty is that actually is being employed mm -hmm. uh, in that effort. Mm -hmm. And it seems that while, yes, you know, so so many times the work was referred to as being withholding, it yeah. feels to me that you were very much an architect of a strategy of refusal. Right? True. <laughs> and that in so many ways that yeah. that's the term we'd use now. Yes. And that's the way we'd understand it now. But you were practicing that yeah. and giving us a sort of paradigm around what refusal right, can look mm -hmm. like to create more complex and deeper yeah. meanings and readings within the work. True. Yeah. And also that I think depending on the lens with which you come to the work and ex certain expectations that one might have of it, it can be, I think, a withholding and it can also be really maybe the opposite, like such a surrender of um, an offering of into a kind of interior world. Well, I think um, when this work was made, I mean, particularly with having a black figure, there were so many assumptions of what that black figure was supposed to hold, represent and embody. And I, I found that very problematic because a, a lot of this immediate thing is like, oh, this is autobiographical. Now there are autobiographical details, mm -hmm. but that there was a very strict and inescapable demand that the work be me. Yes. And that I was trying to say something very autobiographical or biographical about something or about a race or how is it a larger representation where I was trying to bring back the complexities of language mm -hmm. in and around race, in and around gender and sexuality as a way to kind of talk about being human mm -hmm. in a way. So therefore, it's kind of absurd to be asked, you know, in, in terms of my engagement of the press at that time, you know, I, I was always asked to hypothetically imagine myself to be a black woman and what this work means. And I was like, well, I get up every morning and, and look in the mirror. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. And so it's not hypothetical, but that there was always this thing of having a very closed um, sense of what that meant. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, the thing of uh, theater of refusal, <laughs> in a way, is to, that it demands something other than uh, spectatorship. Demand something of your own personal experience. Um, and also, you know, like what I, I also at that time I think very much felt like, well, why can't a black figure be universal mm -hmm. in its positioning to the viewer? And so much of what I got back was like, no, even in graduate school, was like, no, that can't be. Um, so in some ways, that was my persistence that we can have all different kinds of shapes, colors, and forms in terms of uh, representation that all of those uh, visages should kind of come at, be, be arrived to as universal. Mm -hmm. This is also interesting as you say that because a lot of your use of text and narrative or fragmented narrative in this show is not, is a lot of it is um, second person, which is you know, interesting to see that and also witness how much engagement in and around your work has um, kind of assumed that there's a biographical or an autobiographical narrative. 
Um, and something I really appreciate is the use of your second person and the kind of intimacy that that creates, I think, with the viewer in a really it's open ended. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It creates the open ended, hopefully, discourse with the viewer. Mm -hmm. hmm. Could you say something about gestures and your love of gestures? Oh, um, gestures, which is in that room. Um, gestures. And also gestures as oh, a I recurrent mean, theme in a lot of these works, like subtleties and... I think intimate. that was one of, I mean, that's kind of my thesis for graduate school. So um, in going to school in Southern California and being a New Yorker, it was just like, oh my God, you could go to the beach. <laughs> And you could have chicken and wine on the beach, and you could be naked on Black's Beach. I mean, it was this kind of environment that, I, as a New Yorker, I was like, people are living like this every day. So it took me a bit of time to get used to being in that environment. Um, but that said, I, I have to say, like, I, it, it's this thing of you know the kind of uh, careerism of being in graduate school now. When I was there, it was very unusual. Um, to be black and to be in a graduate art department of conceptual art. Although um, Carrie Mae Weems was there a couple of years before I had arrived, and another woman whose last name I cannot remember named Robin, and they would just confuse all of us. Like Robin was maybe about Thelma's height. Carrie is very statuesque. At that time, much bigger than I am. And it was me, and like we just couldn't, you know, we're like, no, I'm not Robin. No, I'm not Carrie. I'm Lorna. You know, that kind of thing. But that kind of isolation for me was very interesting um, coming from New York, which is not, was not kind of conceptually based at that time in terms of education, um, that I just immersed myself in what I wanted to do. And what was, but what was kind of strange about that experience is that in my defense, which I kind of, that was a kind of public installation in a um, storefront that had been, that the, it was no longer leased out, it was an empty storefront and I could put up walls and just have that open to the street. So it wasn't in a gallery setting. And my defense um, of professors that I had to defend my thesis um, in person and have conversations with for a half a day had nothing to say. And I kind of was sitting there like, okay, they're gonna fail me. <laughs> Am I gonna be able to graduate out of this place? And I kind of came and then left and came back to New York mm -hmm. and quickly realized, oh, they didn't know what to say because they didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. And that I had to be okay with that. And so that really, I mean, I didn't doubt what I was doing. I was just like, that was a really good show. I don't, I don't know what happened or is everybody mad at me or something? But I think what that experience gave me was a sense of just do you mm -hmm. and um, continue in this kind of dialogue with yourself, whether it's with other people that I would come back to New York in, in kind of meeting Thelma about a year after that or my, before that I was in deep conversation already with Kelly Jones who was studying, um, getting her PhD. Um, and it just, and coming back to a kind of artistic milieu in New York of filmmakers, uh, musicians, artists, and writers who were really like, okay, forget this shit. We just gonna do it the way we wanna do it. And I think that kind of self possession was something that was really, really potent at that mm -hmm. time. And also with you mm -hmm. in that time of just like with no need for permission, just proceed. Mm -hmm. um, so that piece in that respect is very special to me in that way because it gave me permission to kind of don't, don't, don't be obsessed with kind of what everyone else or fitting some niche or having to discuss it in kind of um, academic ways that may have fallen short because my experience falls outside of that. How do you see that? Do you see that in the same way happening today as you... I mean, I think the art world is different. I, I think there are the, and also the field is m populated by many more curators and directors of color. Um, and, and in a way, uh, there is much more opportunity um, for voices to be eclectic and to have their own shape and a kind of non-conformist, mm -hmm. I believe, um, discourse. 
Um, I think that the, the platforms or the opportunities for that are a little bit more broad now um, and, uh, and are gaining more strength kind of um, institutionally. And certainly you have built a career of creating those opportunities for young curators to have a voice, to be able to make exhibitions because that is the only way that you really understand how to curate is by making exhibitions. So I think that has strongly influenced this field and kind of made it more broad. Now, not to say that that, should, that, that, that work is done and like you don't need to do that, but like that continually broadening of the f field and discourse, I think is, is something that's important that should always be uh, in the forefront of how we think about things and how we think about institutions. Lorna, could I ask you yeah. if you might, because again, when you talk about that moment, it also speaks about how this work created new languages, but can you talk a bit about your formal language? Mm -hmm. How you came both to this structure, the black and white work, and then what the transition to the color work, to the Polaroid, what prompted that and how, how did you get there? Um, I think, you know, having went to college for photography, but the it, it, relationship to its photography is to strip down the image of everything. I think I traveled a lot in my 20s, kind of all over the world, doing documentary or street photography um, in, a, in a kind of insanely short period of time, but spending a lot of time outside of this country. And I think I came back with the idea of like, oh, I have these images and I could show them and they were very good, but I, was, but I wasn't interested in the discourse that that kind of photography um, generated. So if I were in exhibitions, I would be like, okay, this is boring. Not, and also my own work. And I wanted to kind of interrogate. This began a kind of beginning of thinking about the way the viewer looks at the work, of course, and which is for the sake of the viewer, which is the M title of the MCA show. Um, because I wanted to kind of um, pull the rug out under or kind of destabilize the viewer's relationship to photography in terms of their expectation of portraiture or the relationship of image to text of what do you expect to learn about the subject. And so the, part of the openness, part of the way of um, not giving so much information, it's like I've got to make you work from it, from your own experience to kind of navigate these things because that's what I do every day. <laughs> In some ways, the, the way I am confronted in the world or experience the world is this kind of navigation mm -hmm. um, through language and through assumptions and through stereotypes, uh, et cetera, on a daily basis. So how do you kind of convey an experience and at the same time the insufficiency of the words to describe it? Mm -hmm. There's one piece in this show that's new, yes. right? Like that's newly printed yeah. um, that I've never seen before, double negative. Mm -hmm. What made you choose to include? I think like, you know, when you ever have like, it's it's hard for me to come back to this work to like, it's like, oh God, I have to show, like what about the plaques? Would they have enough plaques? I'm like, and I have to say like, um, uh, Jennifer Sue, who's my studio manager, was really amazing. <laughs> it's really the reason that this has come together. It's on many different details with works um, and making sure the details and how they were originally installed, because that is like a visual, and it's mathematical for me, nightmare, um, in, in kind of scaling those things out. But that said, um, Oh my God, what was your question again? <laughs> Double negative. Double negative. So in looking for all of that information, and I have boxes and boxes, because I'm very um, concerned with archive, and even in my own, I mine my own work, it, particularly the photography work is something that gets mined, like I'll just have made photographs during the 90s and then go back five years later and make a whole piece out of work that I didn't, or images I didn't know what I was gonna do with. But in going through this and looking and making sure we have negatives for different things, um, found that one image that's like a double uh, uh, exposure that's upstairs on the top floor. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't do anything with this. Mm -hmm. um, so on occasion, that is kind of rare, but it is on occasion kind of surprising to see that there are things that I mm -hmm. kind of overlooked as just, you know, I have boxes of just outtakes in that way of Polaroids or four by five negatives. And that is one that um, stood out to me now. So we kind of 
bridged it by uh, its title kind of spanning the time yeah. from the time that it was taken up to now, uh, making a print of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In terms of archive, how is that shifting or shifted or stayed the same, your relationship to working with archive? Because of course you've been working with Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine in a really different way than... Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I maybe think with my own work, you know, and this kind of work is um, a bit didactic and also kind of treated it as, I mean, you have African mass, you have this kind of documentation that, uh, or activity of documentation that goes through in repetition. And again, like with Ebony and Jet, it's kind of the same thing in these repetition, like, you know, the millions of Jet, Magni Jet and uh, Ebony magazines at the studio. Um, but that uh, in its repetition and kind of, um, a displacement, a lot of other things can kind of come to you um, because you're not being precious about its origination or that it can kind of take different forms or be played with in different ways. Um, but I, my love of photography, I think, is the thread that, you threw. that is through it. That To me, Jet and Ebony magazines are this archive of visual information, but also um, a kind of social construct of the uh, time period mm -hmm. um, from the kind of 30s to now of uh, those magazines that I just find amazing to keep engaging with. Mm -hmm. So maybe we will see if there are any questions before yeah. you then ask Lorna a final question. I see a microphone here. So are there any questions from our audience? If I can't see you, you're going to have to tell me that you have a question. No questions? No questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, as you have your daughter here, I want to ask how being a mother changed your work and thinking about, yeah, your practice. Um. How did it, I, um, that's, how did it change? I don't think being a mother changed my practice. I think the reception to me as a woman, having a child changed. So I think, I wanna say maybe like there's a picture of me with you and you're kind of on my hip and I have like one of the felt pieces behind me and maybe you're like two. Mm -hmm. And I remember that same day of having a conversation with my dealer saying to me, so you know, you know, women have children, their careers, I mean, you know, it's going to take a dip, you should expect. <laughs> and so I remember being like thrilled that you were there and at the same time horrified by the um, prediction <laughs> that this meant that, you know, male counterpart, oh, you're fine. Oh, you got a kid? Amazing. But for me, that that meant, so I think I automatically was in this position to, to view it as um, this has nothing to do, not, no offense, <laughs> this has nothing to do with my, that my, yeah. that is part of who I am. And I can have a child, um, have okay. a family, but that part of who I am is my work. And so I think when, not to say your question says that, but I'm just like thinking back at this time as she's sitting here, it was more a defense of um, no, that I'm not gonna have that happen. Mm -hmm. um, but have faced that many times mm -hmm. uh, as an expectation, like you should just wait maybe um, and, mm -hmm. and don't work so hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Are that behind that way? Good morning. Um, I just wanted to ask more about, you spoke about how language is slippery mm. and also about um, the strategy of refusal. And I wanted to ask, um, how do you see those coming together and as a, as a way it informs your work? Yeah. Um, um, how do how do I see those two things? Well, I mean, there's a piece that's not here um, that's from a different point, but I think maybe that speaks to a better called, oh, shit, well, now I'm not gonna remember mm -hmm. the, the work um, about the mayor from California. Tom Brown? Um, 
This is a thing when you've done a lot of work. I was going to say. <laughs> and there are many years, right? The two of us are there, like, you like, know, what? the computer. Um, right? Yeah, we're, like, looking at you. It's the mouthpiece or the humming. Seven. Seven. No. 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 Hypothetical. Hypothetical. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Studio, yay. Okay. Um, and with it is a clipping um, mm -hmm. from an interview with the New York Times from Mayor, Mayor Bradley. And the piece is titled, and it has like the, all these mouthpieces, and they vibrate. Um, but it's just a short clip between him and um, the writer. And the question that's posed is, well, hypothetically, if you were a black man, he's saying that to a black mayor, but if you were a black man, would you be angry? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and in some ways, mm -hmm. that struck me so much because th that meant that there was an assumption that he is not who he is, but that because he's mayor, um, that all the violence and um, rioting and um, violence that had taken place in Los Angeles, he was not affected by, but had to imagine what it would be like. Um, that is a conundrum to me. Um, and so rather than me state that, that it's a conundrum, why not just show the conundrum? Or the insufficiency of the language or the position mm -hmm. with regard and how he would respond to that question, that, that it's, a, it's, a, it's an inadequate question. Um, that's based on a premise that doesn't exist. Um, but I think that in of itself is something that um, I think speaks to the core of kind of part of the thing of navigating being in America. Thank you. Maybe one more. Okay. Time for one more question. Right here. Sorry, I saw her. Oh, actually. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, like right. two more, two yeah. more, two more. Okay. Last, no, yeah, the woman in the yeah, last, right here. After that's you yeah, choose. And then, yeah. okay. <laughs> and then in the right. Yeah. And then Sora. Um, hi. Um, I was really interested in hearing you talk about um, sometimes the images um, kind of take a while to form into works. And I was wondering if you could talk about kind of how that works with the language, too. Like if the language kind of emerges from the visuals or if there's some like pieces of writing that you have that end up coming into their work later, um, kind of what that relationship looks like? Um, I think in terms of this, it, it's kind of, it was kind of hand in hand a little bit mm -hmm. um, in trying to navigate that. But I also was very much in a kind of uh, poetic and abstract poetry like that it's about lists. So that I was also stripping language down from this kind of narrative base, although that comes into the work later. Um, and I'm interested in more narrative and prose now. Um, I was really interested in keeping it very sparse and kind of, well, what, like, upstairs um, timepieces died a year ago, died, two days ago, died at the same time, which is really about AIDS, but it can also bunch mm -hmm. our experience from two years ago. Uh, the beginning of the pandemic was certainly that as well. Um, so it is in those kinds of very um, stripped down, um, cues in a way um, that I found far more provocative than to kind of give a full narrative of what I was trying to speak about. Yes. Uh, thank you for this work. Um, you had made mention of doing a lot of uh, street photography in, in your 20s and then kind of not I'm not wanting to show that work because not wanting to engage with the contemporary uh, mm -hmm. discourse around that genre at the time. And then beginning this kind of like trajectory, I guess. Um, and considering the viewer. So I want to ask, what did you mean when you said that you started thinking about the viewer in a different, considering the viewer in the production of the work? Because I mean, I see a lot of like semiotic kind mm -hmm. of, I mean, just from a quick, Thing. It seems like a lot of semiotic right. engagement, but yeah. I, yeah, that's what I want to ask about. It's not, not a fully formed question, but yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, I think in, in terms of uh, the work that it is, the slippery stuff of language and kind of using this scaled back poetics in it as a way to kind of also 
how are we experiencing what we describe in real time about the language. Yes, it's kind of didactic and semiotic um, in its structure, but I think I was tired of the romanticism of the, photo of the photograph, basically, and the portrait, and what that portrait in terms of photography was supposed to convey was, what was it supposed to convey about that person's state of mind or their background or by their clothes and the way they're sitting means a certain thing. So I think at that time, I kind of saw the viewer, you know, and this is kind of an indoctrination from just looking at newspapers and magazines and like all the print media, um, that there are certain um, assumptions about looking at photography and what it's supposed to mean and who's pictured and what kind of narrative by the photographer is being told. And my thing was like, well, what if I don't give that viewer what they want and I give them something else? Does that confound the systems in, by which they use to look at a photograph or to appreciate it? Thank you. Last, and so question. Last, last question, see. Um, I know that looking back at older work or revisiting older work in this kind of way, like maybe sometimes, you know, I'm a bit of a, <laughs> no, <laughs> resistance. Yes. Yeah. Um, why and what's that like right now, like being here? Oh, today? it's lovely. It's not as bad as I thought. <laughs> I like it. I like this work. It's not so bad. Um, no, I think it's more the thing, um, you know, I think, you know, I, I don't know, maybe some people are like, no, this work is always important. It will live forever, it'll be. And, and, and I do kind of, I, I think I enter in so much in real time with the work that I'm doing with a little bit of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I am not certain that this work would hold up. I am not certain, like from the time I made it to even now, to me it's always a question, but I think that's a healthy question to think about. <laughs> <laughs> She's looking at me like, child, please. <laughs> Whatever. Um, but I, I, I think it's, um, it's interesting to want to know how different generations engage the okay. work, and that is important for me. Um, yeah. So while it's difficult, it, it, it's an interesting, um, how can I put it? I feel blessed to be able to ha to see that um, engagement and to have this conversation and, and also to see you know what we've been through and kind of you looking at this work, but that yes, that there may be different ways, and I think that's the important uh, aspect that gener different generations see different work differently, and that is something to be embraced. And I think, Zora, what I have felt, not just from this moment, but in an ongoing way, is I think, I'll speak for both of us, we have benefited from what it is meant to be in conversation with you mm -hmm. as you bring to us ideas about seeing and thinking um, that are very different. And that's been very rich. And to look at this work and think about, well, one, like it spans before your life. Yeah. right, And the kind of understanding of the different intellectual engagements you've had and then brought those to bear on thinking about this body of work um, has been, for me, a great gift. Yeah. Just having, having that and having the conversation that you prompted, right, to not allow us to sit in, you know, the same in ideas. In the past. As, right, right, exactly. <laughs> being nostalgic. Being nostalgic, nostalgic. but being yeah. in a present, right, that's yeah. really, really rich. And I think, you know, again, looking at this work in person, again, reminds me of how truly disruptive it was at that time and how it remains, Lorna, significant and important and speaking so broadly and so deeply. So thank you. Oh, for thank, that. You thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming today. <laughs>